Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much. I feel a bit uh, not only disingenuous because... This is an Al Anon meet, this is an AA meeting and an Al Anon meeting together, but it has been a long time since I have spent much time in Al Anon. Uh, I was a member of Al Anon when I was in Gainesville, and that was 20 years ago. I spent a lot of time there then because I had three sons who I was trying to raise and who thought they needed to raise themselves. And we had a lot of conflict. So conflict, I think, is interesting to Al-Anon and AA members, and so maybe we can talk about some of that, and you will you will uh, get some knowledge that's helpful to you if we talk about that. Um, I grew up in a little town below Macon, about an hour below Macon in Vienna, Georgia, and uh, my dad was the superintendent of schools in that county, and my mom was the president of every club that uh, was down there. And so I thought that it was, uh, that the world was a pretty good place. People treated me nicely. I got a lot of what I wanted. It was a little bitty town. I would go to the drugstore and say, got whatever I wanted, charge it to daddy. I mean, how, how can it get any better than that? Didn't even have to say who daddy was. So, um, my mom had some interesting behavior, however, that I didn't really understand until I heard myself speak about it as an adult. <laughs> when she would eat dinner, afterwards she would go to the bathroom and throw up. It wasn't a secret. She said, Anybody who had a bad gallbladder did that. So I thought, well, that's what happens when you have a bad gallbladder. I guess when I get grown and have a bad gallbladder, I'll just have to throw up after I eat. And so really I didn't give it much thought at all until after I was grown. And I had a friend who was having gallbladder trouble, and I heard myself say, you know, all you have to do is go throw up. And I said, oh, my God. And then I realized that my mom had an eating disorder. Uh, but it was, it was never discussed. And I wonder, she was dead by then, so I wonder if she even knew it. Wonder if she thought she was throwing up because she had a bad gallbladder and she felt better when she did. I don't know. Anyway, there was addiction in my house. And my dad, uh, was going about making everything all right. And uh, one of the things that he did that, since I have been grown, feels more like a curse than a blessing to me, is he said to me, uh, you can do anything you want to do if you try hard enough. And you have a responsibility to the world to try hard enough. And he said that many times. And uh, I uh, played basketball, and I was a good player. And I was a good player not because I had talent, but because I worked hard. And so those kinds of experiences began to make sense to me that if I worked hard enough, I could do anything I wanted to do. However, he didn't say that you can't make other people do it. And I thought, well, if I work hard enough, I can get people in my life to do right. Now, mind you, I never did think that they might have a better idea for their life than I did. I thought I knew what they needed to do, and if they would just follow my instructions, we would not have any trouble at all. 
So you know how in high school the girls kind of like the bad boys? Well, all the girls like this particular fella. And I thought, well, I wonder what there is to him that everybody wants. And so I thought, well, I better check it out and see. And so, of course, because all the, all the girls wanted him, I thought, well, I'll get him. And so I worked really hard, and I got him, and I wish I hadn't, but I did. And uh, I thought, well, okay, I'll change him. I'll change him. And we will uh, have this wonderful family, and he will be happy. And so we had uh, one baby, and it was a uh, it was a wonderful little boy, and that was okay. And soon we had a second baby, and it was a wonderful little boy, and that was okay. And then surprisingly, I was pregnant a third time, and I thought, okay, this is going to be fine because this will be a girl. <laughs> And then it'll make everything okay. I think he probably wants a girl. He doesn't know he wants a girl. He thinks he wants a boy, but I'm sure he wants a girl, and so I'm going to have this girl, and everything's going to be okay. Well, lo and behold, I had that baby, and it was a boy. And so we had three boys, and just right in a row, right in a row. And uh, I decided, well, I, if I have... Five, I guess I would have boys. So I better figure out a way to get a girl because this isn't going well. <laughs> and he doesn't seem like he likes me very much. And I don't know why we even got married. And uh, But now we've got these little boys and they love him. And so i got to fix this because my mom said, the day that I married him, now I'm telling you something, and you look at me, and they had a lot of things to tell me. When you make this bed, I expect you to lie in it. So that was no option. I had to lie in it. It wasn't pleasant. But I, I, I didn't know yet that I couldn't fix that because my dad said I could. So I said to uh, my husband, uh, we need to get a girl. That'll fix everything. We need to get a girl, and you'll be happy, and uh, the boys will be doing well, and I'll dress her up, and everything will look pretty, and we'll act like that this is the family that we were expected to have. And uh, so I started thinking about that, and uh, I found out about an orphanage in Peru. And I thought, well, they must have girls. And so I wrote to the people and I asked them if we could uh, adopt a girl. And they wrote back and they said yes. So we spent about a year going through having a case study. And I thought, oh, my God, if a social worker comes over here and evaluates us, they're not going to let us have her if they know what they're doing. But lo and behold, we got by, and I, I had coached everybody on what they were supposed to say about how it was around there. And uh, so when the caseworker came over, she said, oh, yes, this is a lovely group. She did not know. Uh, and so uh, Bob went to uh, Peru and picked up my daughter and the boys and I went to the airport, and it was when you could see on the walkway coming from the plane to the um, depot, you could, it, you could see it. And I saw him with this little girl, and he held her up. And she was just beautiful. And I guess that that's when God's mercy had begun to pour down on me because she was a joy. She, and, and you know very easily could not have been, but she was a beautiful little girl, and uh, even this morning, she takes very good care of me. She called and said, now, Mom, uh, don't go outside today because the heat index is too high. Just stay in the house. 
And I thought, she is awful bossy. <laughs> Wonder where she got such a thing as that. But uh, we brought her into that horror, and uh, she stayed with us. And she's very different from the boys, but she still is very committed to, uh, to us as a family. My boys began to grow up and get into high school. And I said to them, um, you are not going to be able to smoke pot and drink beer like your friends are going to do. You can't do that because my mother's father, I had discovered by that time in my life, was alcoholic. My mother had an eating disorder, and I certainly was a control freak. I didn't bother to mention that part at that point, though. I just told them about their granddaddy, their great-grandfather, their grandmother. And I said, uh, you can't do it. I sat them all down at the table. And do you know that I thought that was fixed? I had explained it. <laughs> I talked about genes. I explained what was going to happen. And the first time that my oldest son had the car, I got a call from the police station. We, Ms. Ambrose, we have so-and-so down here. For what, he had pot in the car, my car. Oh, my God. And so I went off traping down to the police station to get him. And that was one of many, many trips I made to the police station. And while I was in Peru, toward the end of our time there, I was injured. We were working in an orphanage, and the old man who was there before us decided that we had come there to cause trouble for him. He had been uh, molesting the children that were in the orphanage. And we were just trying to get him out of there because it seemed apparent to me that we just needed to get him out of there and then we needed to go home because there didn't need to be any children in that compound. And so one morning I came downstairs and he pulled a gun and he shot me. And that's when I had my spinal injury. And the boys were 10, 8, and 6. So when we had come back to Gainesville, which is where I raised them, my mother came to live with us. And I would have never learned to take care of myself if she stayed. So I said to her, Mom, you have to go home. Because she was doing all the things that I should be doing. Getting the children ready to school, going and picking them up, all of that kind of thing. I said, you have to go home or I'm never going to be able to make my own way. And so she went home and I got better. And I looked across at my husband one night when I was cooking dinner. He was sitting across at the couch with cut a place in the kitchen so you could see through to the um, den and um, he had tears rolling down his face and I thought that that meant that he was proud of me and I said what's wrong and he, I thought he would say you're just doing such a great job I'm so proud of you and he said it doesn't matter what happens to you you're never going to need me. And I thought, I'm getting rid of him. That is the last straw. If he doesn't want me to have a life, if he wants me to be pitiful and dependent on him, then he's just got the wrong person. And so we went on for four or five years, and then finally I said, you know, you have to go and we divorced and the children were teenagers by then the boys were teenagers and they 
were acting out like you cannot believe. They would go out their windows. They would go off in their car at night if I was asleep. They would sneak people in their windows. I didn't know who I might find in their room. And I thought, well, <clears throat> I've got to get this under control. This is totally out of control, and I've got to get this under control, and it's my job to get it under control. And so I started to try to figure out where in the world I could send them so that I could get them under control. Something had to happen, and I was going to make it happen. And so... I decided I would send the oldest one to treatment. I read around and found out about it. I didn't even know about those kind of treatment. What is treatment? And so I, I read around and found where he needed to go. And so I called my mother, and it was about the time I was going through the divorce. And, you know, it's very bad to get divorced. If you don't believe it, she can tell you all about how bad it is to get divorced. It's very bad. You should never do it. And you are bad if you do it, and there's something wrong with you if you can't make it work. So I called her, and I said, Mom, I'm sending Bush to treatment. She said, treatment? What is treatment? I said, he has a substance abuse problem. He's an addict. And she said, oh, no, he's not. I said, yes, he is. And not only that, I'm divorcing Bob. And she said, oh, my God, who have you told? <laughs> and I said, everybody that will listen to me. And I hung the phone up. And I thought, I have just, something has got to change in my life. And when I went to treatment with him, that is when I began to hear about AA and Al-Anon. And at first, I didn't quite get it, because by the time they had all been through treatment, this is what I would do. <laughs> I would take them to the AA meeting. I would make them sit up on the front row, and I would sit in the back, and I would take notes. <laughs> and when we got back in the car, I would test them to see if they had heard what they were supposed to hear while they were in the meeting. I thought I was being a good mother. And that didn't work. I know you guys don't even, y'all, I don't even have to tell y'all that didn't work. But I didn't know that wouldn't work. And finally some older lady said to me, Honey, you're in the wrong place. I said, What? She said, You need to be over here in this room. I said, what are y'all doing over there? I have to watch them. They'll leave. <laughs> and so <clears throat> she said, just come over here with me. And, and they left sometimes. <laughs> but I began to learn that they were not my problem, that I was my problem. And that as long as I focused on them, my own life became unmanageable. Now, I would come in and out of knowing that. I can tell you this, though. The first time that it became clear to me, that weight went off of my shoulders. And so I never forgot how good that felt to know that I'm not responsible for what they do. I'm responsible for me. And as long as I manage them, I don't have enough energy to manage me. And so what I think happened at that point was I went too far the other way. I threw my hands up. Do whatever you want to do. I can't do anything with you. If you'd listen to me, we wouldn't be, and you'd be off at college, and you'd be doing what you're supposed, so forth and so on. I couldn't get out of high school. 
And I'm thinking, well, you know, I better lower my sights. I thought when my first son was born, maybe he was going to be the president or something. You women who've had babies know how that feels. You look down at those little creatures and they look like, oh my God, nobody's ever had this experience. (laughs) And it's wonderful. I'm going to just tell you some of the things that I did because the more that I admit it, the better I feel about uh, not having secrets. When they were at their worst and before for and doing during I was trying to learn about Al Anon. I would take parts out of their car so they couldn't crank them. I would listen in onto their phone calls and if I could find a drug dealer I'd call the police and tell them who he was. I would uh lock the doors with bells so that if they went out, it would ring. I nailed their windows closed. I nailed them closed. And this is the last thing that I did that I, that really put me over the edge, I thought. I, I'm totally crazy. I've lost it. My oldest son began to have some bipolar issues, <coughs> substance-induced. Uh, And one time, he was manic. Now, I'm telling you, you hear me saying these words with comfort, but at that time, I didn't know those words. I didn't know what manic was. I didn't know what bipolar was. I just knew he wouldn't go to sleep. And I had to go to sleep because I couldn't, and if I went to sleep, he would do something. And I was responsible for that. And the last crazy thing that I did was I handcuffed him to me. Now you think I wasn't slap crazy? I was slap crazy. I thought that I could make them do what they were supposed to do. You remember my dad told me that. And I believed him. So Let me see what else I had down here that I wanted to tell. Oh, they did terrible things like steal and skip school and all those things you already know. And I was embarrassed, and for a long time I'd try to cover, and I would do their homework and try to make them pass the course and talk to the teachers and anything that I could do, I would do. Um, And finally... I don't know which person told me, but somebody that I respected said, you know, it doesn't matter if they're educated or not. They're going to die if they don't stop using. And I heard that, and I believed that, because it was serious. And I had lots of fights that I was up against. My mother didn't believe it. My uh, in-laws didn't believe it. My ex-husband, who was not there, didn't believe it. My, I remember my mother-in-law said to me, you're just not loving them enough. And I said, I tell you what, why don't I send them down there and let you love them? <laughs> and one of them went, and she called me in a couple of weeks. And she said, I'm sending him home. I said, oh, why? Why would you send him home? Well, he's just terrible. (laughs) Yeah, I know. And so we went through that in exaggerated terms, just really exaggerated. And my sacred place was in those Al-Anon meetings because I could say how crazy I was and they didn't judge me. And I was grateful for that. I was grateful for that. And as we went along, I spent more time believing I wasn't in charge than believing I was. And so I got better and better and better about dealing with myself. And it came to me 
that perhaps if I were good to other people's children, perhaps people would come along like you guys and be good to mine. And that was the beginning of Serenity House. I began to, because I had learned a lot. I had worked hard. I had read every book known to man and tried every treatment center available. You know, I remember saying to my friends, they would say, why are you going to Arizona? I said, well, it's just a plane ride. I saw somebody on, now I'm really going to date myself. I saw somebody on Phil Donahue. (laughs) And I thought, that man seems to know what he's doing. I flew to New York. Let me see what he knows. So I really had learned a whole lot. And I could help some people. And so I began to nurture the other people's children. And uh, I put together a program that I thought was loving and at the same time demanding. However, if you didn't want to be in the program, you didn't have to be there. And so I would say to the young men, you know, you just can't use drugs and be here. We'll help you do anything you want to do. And if you find out that you don't want to do this, you can go. But you have to go. And if you want to, you can come back if you want to try it again. And I couldn't find a place like that for my own children. They would get thrown out. It would be some sort of hullabaloo, and they could never come back to that place again. And they were on the blacklist, and it was over. And I didn't think that was the best way to do treatment. And so I decided I sure can't do anything with them. So what I'll do is help some people that are willing to listen to what I say. And so uh, Serenity House was born. And, and, and it's a beautiful place and beautiful kids there. And lots of them have done really well. And I suspect that uh, some of you may know guys who have been in treatment there. And uh, they've done, some of them have done really well. And some of them have not. Sunday, I just went to a funeral of one of the boys who had been there maybe 10 years ago. And I had continued to see him as a private client. And you know, oftentimes, I don't know if it's oftentimes, sometimes uh, mental illness is a part of substance abuse. And this boy was not using, he was just miserable. Just miserable, just couldn't seem to get it. And I saw him on uh, Tuesday two weeks ago and he killed himself on Wednesday. So I felt horrible and sad and like nothing I do is worth anything. Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that? And the truth is, you just can't take care of anybody but yourself. And if I can leave uh, one thing with you, it would be just manage yourself. And if you have somebody around them, around you, like me, that is just all up in your business, <laughs> be gentle. <laughs> They're doing the best they can. Send them to al and maybe they'll begin to get the picture that it's, that it's just uh, impossible to have any control over anybody else. So... Now, I've spent 20 years in the treatment um, arena, and I've spent time with my own children now that's healthy. Uh, I've retired. I've been retired about a year. All of my boys, as far as I know, the last time I was with them are sober, all at one time. And it happened when I said, I don't know what you need to do. You figure it out. Don't come around here if you use and That's all I know. I don't want to be anywhere around it. So um, I appreciate you listening to me. Uh, if you have any questions, 
uh, I'm, I'm willing for this to be an interactive time. Uh, I think we have about five minutes. If, uh, if, you, if there's anybody that's interested in any particular thing that I said, I'm happy to talk about it. Hi. Thank you, Annie, for coming out and sharing. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, first of all, I admire your uh, determination when you first had your injury and your mother was there. You realized that if you stayed there, that you weren't going to be able to achieve or accomplish some of the things that you have. Um, and I think you've already mentioned it that when you were willing to let go of trying to manage your children's lives, that's when, you know, I guess the shift gradually began to happen. Um, you know, I, I only see it from an alcoholic's point of view, and I never quite heard it from, you know, the other point of view. I know they seem like really mean bitches, but they aren't. They just don't know what else to do. You know, so be gentle with them. Right. Uh, but, and I've heard people from AA actually going to Elmont and actually benefiting greatly from um, uh, learning how to take care of themselves. And I think as a sober person in Alcoholics Anonymous, that's probably something that I could probably look further into, you know, uh, because I've, I've been motivated or uh, very inspired by those who have gone to us. Good. So can you maybe just touch a little bit? Well, I can say this. I've treated a lot of young men from ages 15 to 30. A lot. I've rarely seen one that didn't have codependency as well as addiction. And it's the codependency that gets them when they get sober. The codependency will absolutely put them down because they cannot stand it that they can't get people to do what they want them to do. It's painful, and that's why they used to start with the pain. The disease of the feelings, nobody likes to feel bad. So uh, I would recommend that you, I have two books that are old, but I think they're the Bible. And uh, one of them is Another Chance. It's written by Sharon Wegshatter Cruz, who is the wife of Joe Cruz, that was the first medical director at the Betty Ford Center. Yeah, she did just die. Uh, and uh, so that's the name of one of the books, and it talks about uh, an alcoholic family or a drug addicted family and when I first read it I must have read it a dozen times when I first read it all I could say well, was find the parts that didn't pertain to me and then the next time I read it I found all the parts that pertain to my children or my ex-husband well yeah they're all in there it took about three readings for, before I could find Oh, that. Yeah, I do that. And then after I had uh, integrated that into all that I do, I read another book that she wrote that I looked for this afternoon and said to my assistant, well, I must have given the last one away. I couldn't find it. Uh, but order me another one. The name of it is Choice Making. And it talks about the choices that you have in the world. And if I had learned about that sooner, my life would have been so much better. But it's, it's how it's supposed to be, and he has us all in his hands. And I believe that Al-Anon and AA and all of the 12-step uh, programs are the most spiritual programs that I've ever been a part of. And uh, you, you know that when I came from Vianna, Georgia, that I was right up there on the front row in that Methodist church every Sunday, every Sunday. So, uh, but I didn't feel the kind of warmth and the understanding and the insightfulness that I feel uh, when I'm in a meeting like this. Thank you for commenting. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. 
I'm Virginia. I'm in Alamon. Good, Virginia. Um, I have two things to share. One is, and I, I've done a lot of reading and thinking of AA literature, too, because I didn't really know where I fit in. Um, but there's a lot of similarities. But I am an al and it's because I'm a control freak. Yeah. But I look at life like it's a fire, and yesterday's life is ashes and tomorrow's wood. So really, this is the part that's bright. It's just today. So that's very one day at a time -ish. And the other is, I always think about, I'm a mom, too, and I've got kids come along, right, just like me and just like him, and God help them. Uh, Exactly. God help them. I don't know that they could have done another thing. Another thing. If I if I had been my mom, I would have used. <laughs> I'm telling you. Well, the thing that I keep wondering about, and I keep listening to Al Nan and in AA, is you know just that Kenny Rogers song, knowing when to hold them and hold them, and knowing when to fold them. If they're young, they're totally dependent on you, and you know you spend your whole life trying to get past all that, totally dependent on you. So that's what I'm. You know, uh, one of the things that I use as a measurement for that kind of decision is a kind of a an explanation of what I think codependency means. And that is that codependency doesn't mean, because this is what I thought at first, doesn't mean you can't help people. It doesn't mean that. It means you should not help people when there is something you need to be doing for yourself. And this is the only way that I can think about it. If I were coming out of a plane and an old lady had a bag and she couldn't move the bag to the cart, if I were going to meet, if I were going to miss a meeting that was important, if I didn't rush, I shouldn't stop and help her get it on the cart. How I might say to somebody, "Would you help her?" But I should be going on about my business. If there, were, if I had a whole afternoon of free time, I should go over and help her heist the bag onto the cart. And that's kind of the way I think about it. I don't get confused about it uh, when it's uh, people that I don't love so much. When I get confused, it's when it's the people in my family that I love so much. And so I regularly say to them now, and they know, so they ask me far enough ahead so that I can do it. When they ask me, when they ask me for something, I have to say, I need to think about it. I'll call you back. And then I think about, now will this disturb anything that I need to do for me? And if the answer is yes, I call them back and say no. And I say why. And if the answer is no, then I do whatever it is they want me to do. Because I do love them, and I do want to be helpful to their life. And I certainly do want to be part of it. I probably want to be part of it more than they want me to be part of it. <laughs> so uh, when I'm invited, sometimes I'm happy to take the opportunity. Is that helpful? Okay, anybody else? Yes, sir. Hey, Thomas. I, I just feel that, I think that, you know, like having, having somebody like yourself come in that's from al -Anon, into a meeting like this and it's not the family members or anything like that so it's more objective I think it helps a lot of people from thinking because like my family's the same way they want to say yes but I'll call you back and it gets kind of confusing because I'm used to yeah yeah yeah, yeah. They're, they're working on themselves right and, and but, but the problem is is I'm working on myself and so then the transition gets a little bit more confusing and then you, then you put in the whole word, that four-letter word that we all love to say is love. All right? And so it gets confusing. It does get confusing. It's very confusing. It's very confusing. Very confusing. Right? And, and I, I, I don't, I've never been to an al meeting, and I understand the, the concept of, you know, if you really want to love them, say no or think about it. 
But if you're dealing with alcoholics and addicts, usually we want the answer when? Right now. So right now. Yeah, but you wouldn't get that from me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been around long enough that I don't fall for that anymore. I say, well, then the answer's no. You need to know right now. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to thank you for sharing. I usually go to Alamo meeting on Monday. Good. Yeah, I guess you were supposed to have one, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, I'm glad. Kim, thank you for what I thought. You want me to uh, stop? It's time, I think. You certainly may. I got a 19 year old daughter who's over in South Carolina. And from what I'm hearing from the other girls, she's coming off the chain. So I'm going to have to, uh, I got it, I got it worked out where I'm going to see her this summer in a couple of weeks and see what exactly is going on. I really don't know how to, I, she's got to want it for herself. I'm going to right. tell her how to do it. I've been, it took, no one wants to be told what to do. They want to figure it out for themselves. You know, I'm a crazy AA. It took a while for me to figure it out. What's a nice way? I mean, you know, I think about bringing her to meetings, but it's just us old smelly people, and she's young, and, and you know. And well, you know what? Uh, you got me when you said I got to, because you hadn't got to do nothing. What you want, you want to do something, right? You want to do something. So uh, my suggestion would be to say, I want to be helpful to you. Is there anything I can do? Period. Period. Let me know if I can help you. Period. You know, you got to be quiet. I, I, that was, I just thought if I just kept talking, <laughs> something would go in that stupid head of theirs. Yeah. So, you know, period. Period. If she asked you to, she might say, Dad, I want to uh, see what the meetings are like you go to. Fine. Oh, Dad, I don't want to go up there with those crazy alcoholics. I don't like them anyway. That's fine, too. You're powerless. I understand. But I think I should do something. Well, you're offering. Well, he doesn't even know yet if she needs an intervention. He's got to find out. He doesn't even know yet if she needs to be intervened on. Do you? No. So you have to. And, and you know, I, I believe what people tell me till I catch them in a lie. So I would just believe whatever she said unless I found that she was lying. And then I would just say to her, you know, you've lied to me one time. I expect that you'll probably do it again. So I'm not going to believe what you say anymore. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. My name is Judy, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Judy. But I just enjoyed this so, so much, and I'm very, very proud of you. Well, thank you, Judy. Absolutely. And surprisingly, No, you don't. And that helps me because I'm sure my parents didn't know my soul journey and I had to go and down and I was. Yes. But you have spark, spirit, and I guess you can survive. You can survive. You can survive. One of my uh, sons uh, said to me, Mom, you don't know what I need. You don't know what I should be doing. You don't know. And so sometimes I just use that as a mantra if I'm uh, attempting to get into a 
meditative state, I just say, it's okay not to know, it's okay not to know, it's okay not to know, because we don't have to know. I surely don't like it, because not only do I want to know right then, I want to know the details. (laughs) Thank you very much for having me. Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you.